Um, <clears throat> uh, welcome to the Gateway in Church of Squim, all of you in person and online. Or it's nice to have you here. <laughs> Not working. I'll help you. Now, now try. Is it on? Oh no. <laughs> Let me see. We have pre-service uh, prayer every Sunday, 9.30 before church, and we have a prayer chain accessible at any time for prayer needed. Text or email one of the people here, uh, the pastors or someone. <laughs> We have teen ministry next week at 5.30 on Tuesday from 5.30 to 7.30 for all teens. We have a 5.30 Wednesday Bible meeting. It's for any of you who want to come and have more church. You can never have enough. <laughs> we have the women's ministry happening on Saturday, December 10th, for all the women. Uh, I don't think it says the time. Um, it didn't say it on here. <laughs> we have a healing service on Sunday, uh, December 11th. That also doesn't say the time. Um, but you can come for healing and to be at church again. <laughs> We have a church luncheon at uh, on Sunday after church, yes. December eighteenth. Yes. Not this, not this next week, but the week after next. Yeah. For anyone. <coughs> <coughs> uh, we have a Christmas program Saturday, December twenty fourth. Yeah. Come celebrate the season here at Gateway, uh, four p.m. to six p.m. and bring friends or family. Invite your friends. Uh, that's what I just said. But <laughs> invite your friends and your family as well. Anyone who would want to come. And now, Mike. Good job. First one's always the toughest. Oh, you drop it down Okay, hold on, just let me get this set up here. Testing one, two. Hello, testing, testing one, two. Hello, hello, hello. There we go. All right. Got my water here. So good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mark. So before we start, uh, Dan, Cheryl, would you mind come up here for a second, please? Okay. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yay. You come surprise, surprise. Cheryl, Cheryl. Oh. <laughs> so uh, you both have been absolutely amazing. Yeah. Oh. There, um, the work that you have done in this church, many here have not seen um, uh, a lot of what you do behind the scenes. The amount of work and the, and the, the blood, sweat, and tears that you put into this church. Yes. Thank you for all that you do. Yes. There's so much. Yes. And uh, sent out a, um, a message and just ask everybody uh, just to bless you this Christmas. 
And uh, I wanted to give this to you, and I asked people if they felt led to write a little something. So, um, so that's for you. Thank you for everything you do in this church. You both are amazing. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what to say other than thank you. It's a privilege to serve God and to have family and to be able to do what we do. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Oh my I was, as I've been praying this week, and even this morning, it was like, what is our why? And it's to have community. Yeah. And thank you for being community, being family. Yeah. Like, just, it's such a strength, and we just yeah. are so grateful. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for being family and community. Like, I, it's an honor to do life with you guys. Yeah. I love it. Thank it you. really is. Yeah. yeah. It is a lot of work, but you guys are a good investment. Yeah. You're a good investment. Yeah. 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 Take what you got and keep giving. Yeah. Thank you so much for this. What a surprise, guys. <laughs> okay, go back. Hey, you bet. <laughs> All right. So. Today we're going to be talking about the armor of God, but uh, before I get started, oh, okay. Before I get started, I want to share a little bit about me. Uh, I've shared with in the past a portion of my testimony. I want to give you kind of the second half of my testimony, and uh, I do want to say I am so grateful and thankful for this amazing woman back here, Tammy, Amen. my wife, Woo! this beautiful bride of mine. Uh, Prior to marrying Tammy, I was married once before. And sadly, in my previous marriage, uh, I lived a double life. Um, I was, I repeatedly cheated on my, on my previous spouse. In 2003, I was publicly exposed online and at work due to my own poor actions. I went home to write a goodbye letter to my daughter and uh, with plans to, to basically put a bullet in my head. I realized I'd create far more problems doing that versus staying around. I tried to call a good friend of mine. I realized I couldn't do this. After about four or five hours of just sobbing and crying, I, I couldn't do it. And I tried to call my friend, my only friend. There was no answer. I tried to call my mom. No answer. She was, she was busy and it's, it's okay, mom. <laughs> And uh, no more than I hung up the phone, my ex-wife calls. And she was just calling to coordinate things with her daughter. And I interrupted her and says, look, I need someone to talk to. I'm about ready to put a bullet in my head. And, and I told, told her what I did, what's going on. And she told me to come on over. And she prayed with me. And uh, she doesn't realize it, but she saved my life that day. And uh, I went home. Um, continuing to sob and cry, and, and uh, I, I realized um, my only answer, my only choice was Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, um, I rededicated my life, and I told him I'm done. I made the decision. I'm not doing it my way anymore. I'm doing it yours. And through that, I, I prayed three prayers uh, that God would bring good Christian men into my life. Um, because I, I really didn't have any friends. Didn't know how to be a friend. Teach me how to be a man of honor, character, and integrity, because I didn't know how. And to be, bring a good Christian woman into my life. And as I'm praying, God gave me two scriptures. The first one was 2 Corinthians 10, 5, taking every thought captive, making it obedient to Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Second one was Ephesians 6, 11, the armor of God. And as he's given me this, he told me, I want you to memorize this. And so, I mean, uh, taking every thought captive, yeah, that was easy for the most part. Memorize that, but the armor of God, and I looked at the scripture, and I'm like, God, how am I going to memorize this? And, uh, well, he reminded me, I used to be a 911 dispatcher. And we're getting information for a suspect, you know, you know a robbery suspect, what have you. And they gave us a description, and uh, oh well, uh, red hair, purple shirt, black pants, and we we disseminate that information from head to toe. And he told me memorize it that way, and that's what I did, and and uh, 
Put on my helmet of salvation, my breastplate of righteousness, my sword of the spirit, my shield of faith, girding my Lord to the truth and shot my feet with the gospel of peace. Good for you. And I prayed that every single day. Yeah. And uh, going back to work two days later was the hardest thing I ever had to do in my life. Um, there was a lot of humiliation, hostility, embarrassment, but God brought me through it. Yeah. And uh, over time, uh, those three prayers I prayed. First and uh, foremost, this amazing, beautiful bride of mine, she is a gift from God, an absolute gift from God. Um, I got more friends than I know what to do with. Um, and, and this is back in Montana, and I'm, I'm, I'm meeting new friends and making new friends. Uh, and uh, the third, you know, being a man of honor, character, and integrity. That's not something that anybody achieves because right. we're not perfect. Yeah, yeah. But we strive to do that, and I strive to do that every single day, right. to be that man. Yeah. I don't ever want to go back to that life. Yeah. Um, so, as I said today, we're going to talk about the armor of God. So Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, Amen. against the rulers of the darkness of the age, yep. against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand with, uh, withstand the, in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you have been able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, the spirit of the sword, spirit, excuse me, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Praying always with prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance, supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may be old, open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of gospel, and for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And one last thing about my testimony, there was a, there was a uh, scripture that God gave me probably about seven, eight years ago. I don't have it up here, but it's Colossians 1, 13 through 14. And it says, God rescues us from dead and alleys and dark dungeons. He sets us up in the kingdom of the Son. He loves so much. The Son who got us out of the pit we were in and got rid of the sins we were doomed to keep repeating. When he gave this to me, he told me, change the wording a little bit. God rescued me from dead and alleys and dark dungeons. He set me up in the kingdom of the Son. He loves so much. The son who got me out of the pit that I was in Amen. and got rid of the sins I was doomed to keep repeating. Oh, that's good, Mike. Uh, yeah. So when you wake up in the morning, how many of you wake up and you think, uh, when you put your pants on, which leg do I put in first? Uh, mm, which, which one? You don't do that. You just put your pants on, right? Because yeah. it's second nature, right? That's what God wants you to do with the armor of God. He wants you to get to the point where you're not having to think about it. You're just resting in him. You're putting on his armor. That's what he wants. So we're going to talk about uh, the, uh, all the armor. And I want to keep in mind um, this message. I don't want to say properly, but to thoroughly share this message, it would have to be done in a series of about at least three, three weeks. I'm skinning, skimming over each one. There is so much information in this. So just understand, I'm skimming over each one, kind of the highlights. So girding your waist with the truth. Gird means secure on the body with a belt or band. <clears throat> the call to gird your waist or loins is a call to be prepared. A soldier's belt was not just an, an accessory it's also an essential piece of military equipment. The belt was made with strong leather straps and small brass plates for extra protection. Wrapping around the waist, the leather belt was able to, um, to shield some of the most vulnerable areas of the body. 
When preparing for battle, the soldier would put on his belt first, and this was designed to keep all the other pieces of armor in place, especially his sword. The soldier would also wear a cloak worn over his kilt. Prior to engaging in combat, he would tuck in his cloak under the belt, providing maximum freedom for his legs. So just as they are prepared, we are to be prepared. Just as the soldier's belt provides freedom of movement, you are to be kept free from the enemy's lies abiding in God's truth. So John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus communicates two important facts here. God's word is truth. God's word equals truth. And it's by that truth that God sanctifies us or sets us up apart from a holy service to himself. It's important to maintain a clear conscience, always ready to give an answer to those who ask a reason for our hope. This is in 1 Peter 3. We are also to be sober and spiritually vigilant so that we're aware of the enemy as he prowls around. He, he's always around. We need to be guarded with the truth, to be truthful, genuine, and sincere before God and others. This involves not allowing deceit or unconfessed sin to permeate our lives and to separate us from God. To be guarded with the truth is to be firmly established in the truth of God's word. This is foundational to all the other pieces of the armor. So 1 Peter 2.12, live honorable lives as you mix with unbelievers. Even though they would accuse you of being evildoers, for they will see your beautiful works and have a reason to glorify God in the day he visits. God called us to be in the world, but not of the world. We're also to be salt and light to those around us. By abiding in, walking in, and speaking in truth, you will spiritually, you will be spiritually ready in every circumstance. So we're supposed to be in the world. If if all we do is hang around believers and we want we, we want friendship and fellowship, that's good. But we're also called to be around unbelievers. How how are we going to bring people to Christ if we're just hanging around us? And granted. Is that what I want? Absolutely. But that's not what I'm called to do. That's not worth what we're called to do. And it's stepping out in faith. It's it's hard sometimes. <clears throat> so put on the breastplate of righteousness. So the breastplate was usually a tough sleeveless piece of leather or heavy material covering the shoulders, chest, and abdomen protecting his heart and other vital organs. The righteousness and holiness is a distinctive characteristic of God. If we faithfully live in obedience in, to and in communion with Jesus, God's own righteousness produced in us is the practical and daily righteousness that becomes the spiritual breastplate. However, a lack of holiness leaves us vulnerable to the enemy. So Philippians 3.9 not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on that basis of faith. On our own power, we can never be right with God. His righteousness has been imputed to us via his sacrifice on the cross. So what is imputed righteousness? According to Webster Dictionary, impute means to credit or ascribe something to a person. Okay? Righteousness means to be in right standing or right position before God. When put together, imputed righteousness means right standing and right positioning has been credited to you. This is what happens to us. We're broken, sinful, no right standing before God because of our sin. However, Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life. When you put that, your trust in him, he takes his righteousness and he credits it to your account. You gain access to righteousness, not because of anything you did, but because Christ applied it to your account, to your life. This imputed righteousness puts you in right standing before the Father. It's a free gift. 
Romans 1.17 says, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So something that uh, Dana had shared a while back. Righteousness is expressed in three ways. Knowing what, to the best of your ability, your life is in the right condition with God, with people, and with yourself. Okay? All right. Shot on your feet with the preparation of gospel of peace. So being prepared for spiritual battle, having the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your mind, hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 5.7 says, Cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything in prayer and supplications and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Someone once said, No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, you'll know peace. Each of us needs to be at peace with God. This involves casting our cares and anxieties on him. These last days will cause people's hearts to fail them for fear of all that is coming upon the earth. Amen. 2 Timothy 1.7, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. Right. Yeah. I believe we are in, in, in end times. I absolutely believe that. And there's example after example after example out there. And you can see it. You can see it. That's for another message. But we are not to walk in fear. That's right. So what's fear? You ever seen the acronym? False evidence appearing real. 90% or more. It's all an illusion. It's the enemy uses. It's besides the deception and lies, it's fear. It's, it's an illusion. 2 Peter 1.3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. No matter what happens, we can be confident that our God is ultimately in control and that he has the last word. Amen. Cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Live a lifestyle that creates peace. Mm -hmm. So next one, your shield of faith. Ephesians 6.16, in addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The Roman shield was made of bonded wood strips and covered in leather. The shield was semicircular so that any arrows and spears would be deflected to one side. The Romans feared, was they were feared for their effective military tactics and battle formations. And one formation in particular was known as the tortoise. <clears throat> so named because the soldier's shields would protect the men like a tortoise shell. Okay? Even the enemy's fiery darts, which were dipped in flammable liquid and set on fire, were ineffective to the Roman shields because the Romans drenched their leather-covered shields in water before going to battle. Just as the Romans drenched their shields in water to extinguish the arrows, God gave us our shield to extinguish the fiery darts of lies and deceit the enemy throws at us. Now, Ephesians 6.16, the, uh, the key word here is extinguish, okay? The imagery here is to quench or snuff out the fiery arrows the enemy throws at us, okay? His sole intent is to steal, kill, and destroy, primarily through fiery arrows of deception to twist God and God, excuse me, to twist and distort God's word. So there may be a number of flaming arrows flying at you throughout the day or the week. Okay? Stress, anxiety, loneliness, shame, fear, guilt. What does what does a fire do when it's not quenched? It spreads and grows, right? A fiery arrow does not just stick in and wound the target. 
its destruction spreads from that initial insertion and it grows. It consumes and it burns up the thing that it hits. Satan's arrows cannot just be deflected and locked away. They must be extinguished. Take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. I'll talk more in detail about this a little bit later. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Jeremiah 32, 27. I am the Lord. The God of all mankind is anything. Is anything too hard for me? Really, is anything too hard, hard for God? Each of us will face difficult situations and temptation of the enemy at one time or another in our life. Our shield is the protection God gave us to get us through these, these challenging times. Faith isn't about us. It's about the thing that we're putting our faith in. Our faith is not in our own strength, in our own abilities, but it's in the nature and character of God. It's putting our faith into him, in Jesus. Hebrews 11.6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Even a weak and feeble faith accomplishes much in the spiritual realm because it's not the faith in our own strength. It's a faith acting in God's strength, and that's where the faith's real power comes from. All right, our uh, helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Ephesians 6.17 instructs us to put the whole armor of God and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. When a soldier suited up for battle, the helmet was the last piece of armor, armor to put on. The helmet was vital for survival, protecting the brain, the command center for the whole body. If the head is badly damaged, the rest of the armor is little, little use. The same goes for a person without hope. They're vulnerable to the enemy's lie and may have feelings of what's the point? Life's worthless. We lose our hope. Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The help of the salvation guards the mind by providing your hope which is a joyful and confident expectation that God keeps his promises. Salvation is not something that you work towards. It's a free gift that uh, we receive if you publicly declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe with your heart he died on the cross. And God raised him from the dead. There are several actions a believer can do to keep this helmet fastened and functioning using the sword as you as needed. First one, reject doubts that are arising from the circumstances in life. We're sensory creatures. Um, what we see, smell, hear, taste. Um, if we don't understand it in our, fence, tense, in our senses, a lot of people tend to just disregard it. If we allow them to, the circumstances may convince us that God doesn't really love us and that his word is not true. It's impossible to have faith and doubt at the same time. It's impossible. It's one or the other. Yeah. God's reward is, uh, excuse me, God rewards our faith. With the helmet of salvation firmly in place, we can choose to believe what appears to be impossible. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Keep an internal perspective. When light crashes in us and around us, we must remember to look up. Our salvation is the most precious gift that God has given us. Keeping our eyes on that can help us to weather the storms. We can choose to our lives, excuse me, we can choose to live our lives by the motto if it doesn't have eternal significance. It's not important. It's about him. Remember the victory is already accomplished. When we consider ourselves dead to sin but alive to God, we eliminate many of the opportunities Satan uses to entrap us. Our hope is in Jesus. When we have hope, he forgives us and transforms us into likeness. Knowing Jesus brings contentment regardless of our material possessions 
and joy despite the difficult circumstances we experience. Nothing can destroy this hope because it's stored in heaven. No earthly power can touch that. It's ours. Lastly, renew your mind. Romans 12, 2. Don't conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, perfect will. Our minds are battlefields. There's a battle going on every single day up here. The outcomes of those battles determines the course of our lives. Old thought patterns and worldviews need to be replaced. We must allow God's truth to continually wash away world's lies, confusion from our minds, and adopt a God's perspective. Learning to use the sword of God's word requires many hours of practice. And don't wait until the heat of the battle to learn to use your sword. Rather, store scriptures in your mind and your heart on a regular basis through memorizing prayer. 2 Timothy 2.15 do your best to present yourself to God in one as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. A worker does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. If we are to use our sword, we need to memorize scripture to be effective in renewing and guarding our minds. David, Star, would you mind handing out flyers for me? Uh, I got these two to hand out flyers. They're just recommended scriptures. I would encourage you when you go home, um, start with one. And unless, if you've already done that, awesome. Keep memorizing scripture, but there are a sword. Yeah. <clears throat> so the more you memorize and meditate on God's word, the more natural it will become to use your sword. You will gain confidence in speaking the word, praying the word, and singing the word. The scripture you hide in your heart and apply to your life will be with you at all times, yes. even when you don't have your Bible. That's right. Excuse me, I need to take a drink of water. Ooh. I'll put this over here. <laughs> so, remember when... Uh, I talk about flaming arrows and the enemies' lives that we talk about. Okay. Anybody recognize what these icons represent? Recycling. What else? When you play, what's that? Repeat. When you're playing music, you hit that button, and it's repeat over and over. Right? You're playing the same group of songs or same song. Okay. Has anybody ever done something foolish or had something happen to them in the past that resulted in a negative experience in your life? Yeah, daily. No one, that's never happened to anybody here? Daily. That's, that's the only oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So we, we go through that negative experience and what does the enemy do? He hits that repeat button. Yeah. Causing you to replay that moment in your mind over and over and over where it consumes you. What you got to do is put a stop to it. You have to stop it. And God's given us that sword to do that. You need to take these thoughts captive and make it obedient to Christ. And you need to speak God's truth. Second Corinthians 10.5 we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I want to briefly talk about conviction versus guilt and condemnation for a moment. Because we've all gone through, we've had these negative experiences, and I'm sure I went through it in the past also, is feeling guilty, oh, I said this, I did this, or what have you. Guilt does not come from Jesus. Okay. Conviction shows you the answer. Condemnation shows you the problem. <clears throat> Conviction helps you change. Condemnation says you'll never change. So here's another example. Look at Jude, Peter and Judah. Conviction drove Peter to repentance. Condemnation drove Judas to suicide. 
God convicts us, the enemy condemns us. Okay? Romans 8 1 says, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Are some of you currently struggling with that negative experience that keeps repeating yourself in your mind every so often? Is it consuming you? You take these thoughts captive, make it obedient to Christ. The spirit of fear be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. Give me courage and boldness. Trust you, Father. So when I memorized 2 Corinthians 10 5, it wasn't that I just memorized the whole verse. For me, it's, I take these thoughts captive, make, make an obedient to Christ. Spirit of fear be gone. Spirit of anxiety be gone. I don't want this. Take it away. He takes it away every single time. Now, will it come back? Five minutes, five hours? Absolutely. And what do you do? You do it again. Absolutely. Just an analogy, look at all the all the wars that have happened. Um, there's always battles. Um, in the end, we, uh, Jesus is one. He's one, but there's still battles going on. <clears throat> we need to use our sword. So what we ask to leave, whether it be spirit or anxiety, fear, anxiety, <clears throat> excuse me, we must replace it with God's truth. Yeah, that's right. So again, I said this earlier before, but our minds are battlefields and the outcome of those battles determines the course of our lives. So if you're feeling stressed, pray for God's peace. <clears throat> Experiencing anxiety? Put your trust in Jesus. Are you lonely? Seek out and rest in Jesus. And may I add, if you're lonely and you're looking for friends, if you want a friend, you got to be a friend. you got to step out. That's right. It's not easy. It's hard. Yeah. It's taking a risk sometimes, but you got to step out. And um, if you want a friend, you got to be a friend. Yeah. That's right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Feeling shame. Whoever believes in him will not be shamed. I'm feeling guilty? I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. Yeah. So I have a question for you all. Are you all struggling with that negative experience that keeps repeating itself in your mind? Is it consuming you? Are you wanting to personally know Jesus? Do you want to rededicate your life to Jesus? Um, I've asked Catherine, uh, there'll be a few people coming up here for prayer. And uh, if I could have a couple over here and a couple over here, um, I would encourage you to come up for prayer. If you're struggling, if uh, you have that, that repeat button on, put a stop to it. You need to pray for, your, pray for yourself, but it's also good to have people pray for you too. It's vitally important. And one last thing, I want, to, I want to pray for you all. Father, thank you. I pray that no one here today would bear the weight of life alone. I pray all that we trust in the powerful presence of God and carry our burdens with us and for us. That he would prepare and cover us in his righteousness. That he would take every thought captive, make it obedient to Christ in every circumstance of our life. And I pray God would give us all the peace that surpasses all understanding through Christ Jesus. No matter how weak or doubt-filled we may feel, that God's strength would raise up, that we would raise up our shield of faith, blocking the fiery arrows, extinguishing the arrows. I pray we are humbled and walk in confidence. And boldness, knowing our salvation is not only a free gift, but is secure. Mm. Father, we just thank you. We love you. Amen. Thank you. So, uh, if anybody wants to have prayer, please come on up. Thank you. Amen.